Wonder can be a miracle, a source of awe, but also a puzzle that leaves you, well, wondering something. I'm Marcus Smith. Welcome to an episode of the Constant Wonder Podcast in which you and I will have a chance to puzzle over whatever it was that took so long for anyone to finally invent street medicine as we know it today. I'm talking about emergency medical services, paramedics, the sort of thing that showed up in history long after primitive ambulances were already on the scene. And if this installment of our podcast goes as planned, the story we're about to hear will convert our wondering into wonder. That is to say, into awe and gratitude and humility in light of what a handful of African Americans in Pittsburgh were able to accomplish. This is the story of something they were able to pull off with real determination and unbelievable patience when you think about the context of racial prejudice in which they did it, all to help establish the field of medicine now thought to be a given, emergency medical services. This kind of critical care away from hospitals has not always been a given. There was a time not all that long ago, during my own lifetime, if you really have to know, when just about anywhere in America, if you needed to be rushed to a hospital, you might end up getting a lift in a hearse from some local funeral home. Let's go back to a point about five decades ago. In Pittsburgh at that time, if there was a medical emergency, who arrived at your door were the police. If you lived in the suburbs, it might be a volunteer fire department or it might be a funeral home because you know, at that time, transport of bodies, live or otherwise, was left to anyone with a vehicle capable of doing it. And in most places, that was a hearse. You know, not everyone had something big enough to transport a recumbent body. And so you would have undertakers embalming one night, transporting bodies the next. A call comes in. They sweep the flower petals from the last funeral out of the back of the hearse. They load in a stretcher, and they come tearing off, and they show up at your house with a little bit of knowledge and basically no equipment. Well, the police had a dedicated vehicle, and they had dedicated personnel, but that's essentially all. These were guys who had not been through any sort of training in years and years and years. So they were certainly not up on any of, of what you consider the latest technology. And when it came to street medicine at that point, there was no latest technology. It had not advanced in decades. That's how truly primitive things were as recently as the 1960s. But then a major inflection point came when, get this, when... A VIP was in dire straits. Isn't that the way? It took a high-profile medical emergency to get the mental gears churning among some medical professionals who were insightful enough to say to themselves, maybe things don't have to be this way. Maybe thumbing a ride on a hearse to a hospital for eventual treatment, if you should happen to be even that lucky, well, maybe that's a wee bit Neanderthal. Here's how their inherited assumptions first began to crumble. It was at a political rally in Pittsburgh. In November of 1966, there's an election going on for the governor of Pennsylvania, and it's a very tightly contested race. And so the weekend before the election, the Democrats of Pittsburgh hold a rally, and it's supposed to kick off this whole, you know, four days of furious campaigning. And there's a number of speakers who are there, all of them prominent Pittsburghers, but none more so than David Lawrence. David Lawrence had been a mayor. He had been a governor. He was a close friend of Lyndon Johnson. This was a guy who nothing moved in Western Pennsylvania without his help. Everybody is, is sort of quiet and staring. He steps up to the lectern, begins his speech, and he topples backwards and he hits the stage. And then he falls forward, smashing the lectern and drops on the ground. Everybody comes rushing to his side, and they're, they undo his tie, they unbutton his collar, and there's a woman standing next to him who begins praying, and people start yelling for doctors. And in the back of the room, there's this young nurse named Karen McGuire who charges forward, so pushes her way through the crowd, and drops on the ground and checks for a pulse, finds one, but notices that he's not breathing. So she begins to provide him with rescue breaths. Now, at the same time, someone has reached out to the nearest hospital which is called Presby, Presbyterian University Hospital, and said, hey, David Lawrence has just collapsed, and he's going to be there in a few minutes. You can imagine the sort of panic and alarm that must have set off in a hospital. That's Kevin Hazard. He's the author of American Sirens, 
the incredible story of the black men who became America's first paramedics. Where was I back in 1966? Well, I myself was just a four-year-old Navy brat growing up in San Diego, California. It was in an era when America's seemingly endless battle for racial equality was heating up again. Ever hear about the 60s? Racial tension informs every aspect of Kevin Hazard's account and, in my view, actually heightens the wonder of how things played out. By the way, the word paramedic had not yet been invented. There lying on the podium, helpless, is one of the most important men in Pennsylvania, with a stunned, silent crowd looking on. So Nurse McGuire is on the floor, and she is rendering first aid to David Lawrence. Suddenly, the back doors of this massive auditorium burst open, and in come a pair of city of Pittsburgh ambulance drivers. And they come, you know, barreling through, and they have this sort of a canvas cot that they would carry. They drop it down on the ground. She looks up to begin, you know, saying, hey, this is what we have, and this is what I'm doing. They sort of muscle her aside and begin to grab Lawrence, who's a, he's a large man, and they, they lift him up and they drop him down on this canvas cot. So she turns around and she sees an oxygen canister that they've brought with. So she tries to connect Lawrence to oxygen and the canister is either broken or empty because she can't get anything out of it. So the cops now hoist this canvas stretcher and they start running for the door. She's running alongside them, trying her best to continue to deliver some sort of aid to David Lawrence. And by the time they reach the back door of the auditorium, she notices that he's beginning to turn blue. So she takes this to mean not not only is he not breathing, but that maybe he doesn't have a pulse. The cops yank open the back door of their wagon and they sort of jam this cot, like a military style canvas cot. They put it in and then both of them jump out as though they're gonna run to the front and drive and ride. Neither of them is gonna be in the back with Pittsburgh's most prominent citizen as he is dying in the back of their vehicle. She sees this and sort of wiggles her way in before they take off. So now she is in the back of this huge wagon and She notices now that he has no pulse, kind of at the same time that the two back doors slam and the thing speeds off. I have been in an ambulance. I can tell you if somebody's driving recklessly, uh, imagine trying to to do anything in the back of, say, a moving truck, right? You can't tell when when it's going to turn, when it's going to stop, when it's going to accelerate. And so you're just being flung about. And that's really where she was. She's being tossed all around. So from the moment that the police arrived at David Lawrence's side, he is getting no aid. His doctor will, in the coming weeks, point out that when it comes to these medical emergencies where, you know, someone is not breathing and they are, and their heart is not beating, what we now would call, you know, cardiac arrest, that seconds matter because time is brain. It's it's much like it is with a stroke. Every moment that you are not getting oxygen is another moment that your brain cells are dying. And so this isn't just seconds that are passing. These are minutes, five, 10, 15 minutes pass where he gets zero aid. So this wagon backs up to Presby, which again has been alerted to his arrival. And a number of doctors are out there waiting for him, including Peter Saffer, who is the father of CPR, quite literally the man who developed not only rescue breaths, but paired them with chest compressions prior to his work that was not done in any form. They open a door and he finds someone who he deems to be clinically dead, which means he's not breathing, he has no heartbeat, you know, he, he is going to become dead, dead, unless somebody can do something quickly. And within 20 minutes of his arrival, he has, he has had a full workup. They have a pulse back on him. They have a respiratory rate back on him. And though both of those fail and are restarted throughout the course of the evening, they manage to stabilize him. But it's clear that from the time David Lawrence was lying on the ground when the police arrived until the moment that he backed up to the hospital had killed his brain. There was there was nothing you could do. So they could save his heart, they could save his lungs, they could save all of his organs, but they couldn't salvage his brain. That realization, that sort of hard fact that this man was sort of almost saved but not saved, leads the city to say, okay, something needs to be done about street medicine. We've got to figure something out. And as luck would have it, Peter Saver happens to be in Pittsburgh and he kind of holds his hand up and says, I've been trying to tell you for 10 years. And that death begins, that unfortunate death begins everything that we know today about EMS. Kevin Hazard is just not one of those journalists who watches from a safe distance to keep from getting, you know, your hands dirty. 
When he talks about the work of paramedics, the history of their profession, he is actually speaking from his own firsthand experience. Here's how he plunged into the field, inspired by a moment two decades ago that shook the world. I graduated from college and became a reporter. And so I'm working at this tiny newspaper uh, covering city council meetings. And I had actually, I'd written a story about speed bumps. Like, you know, how much concrete or asphalt needs to be placed in a speed bump. And this is shortly after 9-11. And I've got a number of friends who are in the Air Force, the Marines, the Army, and they are all over the world. And, and though I had never myself wanted to, you know, I, I didn't have an urge to, to join the Army, I am watching these guys that are, you know, sort of witnessing or taking part in history. And I'm writing stories about speed bumps. And I was already restless because I felt I was... I was too young to simply be an observer. I needed first to take part in the world. And now this happens where I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the world take place around me. And I need to find some way that I can take part in, in uh, the, 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 you know, some way that I can be more active and be more vital. And one night, out of the blue, my editor says, hey, I need you to cover this story. And he scribbles an uh, address on a piece of paper and hands it to me. And I jump in my car and I drive down. And at that time, there's this massive wastewater project that's taking place in Atlanta. And they've got this, I don't know how to describe it any other way to say this colossal hole, hundreds of yards wide, hundreds of yards deep. And it rises up out of the ground. And these workers who were trying to lay the concrete around it were on scaffolding that collapsed underneath them and they just disappeared into the earth. And so the county's high angle technical rescue team is sent out and I'm there to cover it. And family members of these men who are presumably at this point, we, we, we assume nothing good is going to come of this. So these men who are probably dead, their family members are standing next to us. And I'm watching this incredibly sort of important, horrible moment. And the people who have been sent to sort of try to make sense of it and, and to, you know, bring some sort of closure to it are these four or five firefighters. And I watched them disappear down into this hole. And then 30 minutes later, I watched them come back out. And as they begin to bring, which of course are bodies and I'm watching the way that they carry themselves and sort of the way that they speak to the family members and the way that they speak to the police officers. And just, I'm looking at these guys and it was just like this sudden click. Like these are people who have seen something, who have learned something. They, there's some essential truth that they've been able to put their fingers on that I don't know. I've been looking for my, my thing. I've been looking for my, my answer. And suddenly here it was, it's crystal clear. And so I went home that night and I told my wife, I said, I think I, think I want to do this. Now, she's a type A personality. And so she said, well, I know you. Don't talk about it. Just do it. And so I quit my job at the newspaper. I went to EMT school, and I spent a decade racing through the streets of Atlanta on, you know, in the back of an ambulance, uh, you know, trying to wrangle emergencies large and small. The interesting thing about working on an ambulance is that it's sort of a throwback to 19th century house call medicine. You know, the patient summons you, and you go to their house, and you kneel on the floor next to them. And, you know, your, your tools are limited, your knowledge is limited, but you have this extraordinary connection with these people. And, you know, you, you also have a view of them and their lives and, and the sort of conditions that led to their predicament that nobody else does. You know, it's this incredibly vital link in the chain and it's an incredibly human part of medicine. And in a world in which so much of medicine is, is sort of, you know, crazy fiber optic machines that nobody understands and that we have a hard time with the acronyms, and yet paramedics are kind of almost not known or, or overlooked. Because Kevin Hazard is a researcher and a storyteller, as he launched into his own career as a paramedic, he stumbled onto and began fleshing out one of the most compelling, least known stories available to him. What he found out was that among the earliest pioneers in emergency medical services, arguably those who did the very most to create the field, was a group of African Americans from a poorer neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hazard started to zero in on this group, known as Freedom House, and he began to wonder, why haven't I heard of them before? Paramedics just exist in a quiet, forgotten corner of medicine, but it's an incredibly important thing. And it's something that changed my life. 
And yet I did not know its origins. You know, when I went through EMT school, when I went through paramedic school, nobody had said, hey, do you, do you guys know how this thing started? So I had no idea. And when I began to learn the story of Freedom House, I was blown away. I was humbled to know that I was a piece of this history, that these were my you know, intellectual forefathers. But I was also sort of horrified that this incredible piece of history and that these incredible people had somehow been put into you know, the sidelines. And I, I knew immediately that it was something that needed to be addressed. To put this all together, you have to jump back a few years and peek in on President Lyndon Johnson signing the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964. A profusion of nonprofits came into existence. Often as not, these programs began in low-income neighborhoods, many of these black, and many of the nonprofits just fizzled. Some bred controversy, but a few established deep roots and survived to bear fruit. Freedom House was one of these. But Freedom House began with a mission not at all connected with emergency medicine. Freedom House was a small nonprofit that existed in a neighborhood of Pittsburgh called the Hill District. The Hill District is this, you know, incredibly diverse and rich place that has had a, a very <laughs> difficult history, to say the least. But the mid-1960s, it had had its legs cut out from underneath it by the local government. And so this activist said, we're going to create an organization and we're going to call it Freedom House. We're going to provide training and jobs for people from this neighborhood. So, you know, almost exclusively African-American. And they said, whatever it is that, that people need, you know, if you want to start a business, we'll help you start it. If you want to get a job, we'll help you learn how to do that job. But they're very small. And so how they start out is with a vegetable truck. And they're driving vegetables around the city. So you're going to tell me that the vegetable truck gets converted to an ambulance. You're going there, aren't you? <laughs> it does in spirit. Luckily, it did not in, in actuality. But it does in spirit. Somebody sees an article about the vegetable truck. And it's a man named Phil Hallen who runs an organization that provides money to people like Freedom House. And he sees them delivering fruit. Now, Phil Hallen uh, had his roots in medicine and public health specifically. So he was well aware of how bad Pittsburgh police um, ambulance service was. And he was desperate to find a way to fix it. And so he opens a newspaper one day and he sees these guys delivering vegetables. And in Phil's mind, he said, if you can deliver a vegetable, you can deliver a person. Phil reaches out to Jim McCoy, who was a founder of Freedom House. And he says, Jim, I want you to take your people and your fruit trucks, and I want you to create an ambulance service. And of course, Jim doesn't know how to do that. And Phil doesn't know how to do this. So they go to Presbyterian University Hospital, which is where Peter Saffer is. And what they don't know is that Peter Saffer has for years been trying to develop the, the training and the methodology and, and even the name of, you know, the, the name paramedic doesn't exist. So Peter Saffer has been trying to build this, this street medicine from the ground up. And, and he, he doesn't want it to be something simple. He wants it to be all encompassing. He wants, he wants them to be able to deliver babies and treat seizures and heart attacks and strokes and gunshots and every, everything imaginable. And basically, he wants them to function as, a, as an ER doctor. His only problem is that he doesn't have any people. He has the ideas and he has the, the know-how, but he has no people. And so he's developing this, this idea. And independent of him, Phil Hallen and Jim McCoy are rounding up the people. And Hallen and McCoy walk into Presbyterian one day and they said, hey, do you have any interest in this thing? And Saffer just unloads. And for 40 minutes, he just goes on. And this is, you know, Saffer is this, you know, sort of wiry, Austrian, very thick accent, um, incredibly brilliant you know, walks fast, talks fast, drives fast, and he just starts going and going. And Helen and McCoy are looking at each other like, what did we just stumble into? And immediately, Helen realizes this guy wants to start a revolution. He wants to change emergency medicine forever. And this is not what we signed on for. This is not what we're here for, but I love it and we're going to do it. And there's just one problem. And that's that our people have no training. They don't, some of them don't have high school. Some of them don't have driver's licenses. This is not you know, we are not coming to you with, with a group that is, you know, has all this expertise. In fact, the reason we're coming to you is because our people have been denied expertise. And Saffer says, well, actually, that's even better. Because what I want to do is I want to prove to the world that normal people, someone off the street, can practice medicine as well as someone who's been trained in an emergency room. And he said, so if you have ordinary people, then I've got the job for you. 
And of course, Helen McCoy said, we got boatloads of ordinary people. Let's do this. And that is the birth of, of what becomes the world's first paramedic service. Now, I want to step back here a little bit with you and consider sort of the global context for all of this because I grew up seeing MASH, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital or whatever that MASH stands for. And, and, and then I hear stories about uh, my great-great-uncle serving in World War I and on the battlefields near Belgium and France. And there were medics. There were, there were people. You even just mentioned uh, medical personnel in the 1800s making house calls, for instance. Uh, what are you going to call street medicine if we're going to talk about the birth of paramedics or uh, emergency medical uh, services out on the street, was there not some kind of form of this beforehand? So this is what's most interesting about this this whole story is, is how many times we had it and we let it slip through our fingers. There's mention in the Bible about the Good Samaritan. What does he do? He, he finds someone on the side of the road, picks him up, bandages his wounds with oil and wine. I'm not certain how helpful it was, tosses him over the back of a donkey and then takes him somewhere, takes him to an inn, right? So almost the very first paramedic in in history occurs in the Bible. And throughout history, we have these moments where there will be a group that will step forward. Maybe it's during cholera where hospitals begin to say, okay, we're going to send out carriages to to remove infected patients and separate them from the population. Or maybe it's during the various wars, Napoleonic Wars, uh, the Crimean War, the American Civil War where these things are needed. And so sort of on the fly, they have to create some sort of a mobile medical service. World War I is a huge step forward in that, as you mentioned. It's the first time that radios are used. It's the first time that there's sort of a a triaged field hospital system where they would train actual medics to be there in the trenches, treat the wound, then they would carry them to a small dressing station where they would get slightly more advanced care and then bring them from there to a field hospital. So these things are, are kind of happening incrementally. And after World War I, it feels as if th- this is going to uh, be a field that's going to continue to grow unhindered for the first time. And then World War II hits. And there's such an incredible drain on both resources and people that all the hospitals that had picked up ambulance services ditch them. And they wind up with police or fire departments. And neither the police nor the fire department was the sort of place that had been put there to deliver babies or to treat the wounded. And so they take a step backwards. And interestingly, as civilian medicine in the U.S. is slowly sort of tumbling, military EMS is getting better all the time. I mean, corpsmen have a closet full of medals of honor. There's no shortage of stories of the incredible work that these guys do, but there never is a civilian analog. And primarily because once it moves from the hospital and into public safety, then it becomes a question of, well, who's going to pay for this? And no politician wants to say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this brand new and probably expensive thing that may or may not be effective because you know there are a lot of people who are, who are convinced that, well, like if we give somebody a little bit of training. Is that going to be helpful? Are they really going to be able to do anything? So there's some doubt. And there's also fear about how much this is going to cost. In 1965, there's this pamphlet that gets published. Technically, it gets published in 66, but its its findings are from 1965. So 1966, this pamphlet called the White Paper is published. And what it says is that paramedics are too few to be there when you need it and too untrained to do any good when they arrive. And the statistics that they use to show that are one, In 1965, more Americans are killed in highway accidents than were killed in the entirety of the Korean War. And the second is that in 65, you are more likely to survive a gunshot wound in Vietnam than you are to survive a gunshot wound in Kansas City. The reason is that the guy wounded in Southeast Asia has a corpsman next to him. The guy shot in Kansas City has nobody. And he will eventually be tossed into the back of a pickup and slung across town and met by whomever happens to be there when he goes to the hospital. And that is the first time that on a national level, the country began to reckon with, well, we've got a major crisis. And they they refer to this as the epidemic of trauma. And rather than, than getting their arms around this and really tackling it, they hand it off to the Department of Transportation. So of all the bureaucrats that you could saddle with bringing emergency medicine into the 20th century, they chose perhaps the worst ones. So really nothing happens on the national level, but it was things like 
the white paper coming out and the death of David Lawrence that, and there are a couple of them throughout the country, Peter Saffer, perhaps the most energetic, intelligent, and successful of them, picks up on those threads and says, okay, this thing that I've been trying to do, I've been sort of yelling to people for years now that lives are being wasted. There may now finally be the public will to get this done. And they just sort of use that moment to bull their way through the door. We're calling them the world's first paramedics. And we talked a little earlier about there's MASH and there's other precedents elsewhere and there's the military. And I'm wondering if you get any pushback on calling them that by that term, the the, the world's first paramedics. Yeah, you know, people ask the question, um, is that the case? Or they say, well, you know, there was this other organization here or there. When you say paramedic, you are referring specifically to a civilian organization. Obviously, corpsmen preceded everybody else. The second is the way I would define a paramedic is by his or her training. And in Belfast, they created something which is essentially called a cardiac tech, which they were very specifically trained to treat cardiac emergencies. The city of San Francisco had a number of medics, but they were specifically trained to treat cardiac emergencies. And a lot of the other organizations come out a year or so after. Of the organizations that exist in 67, none of them have the breadth of training that Freedom House does. Saffer incorporates everything that did, pediatrics, trauma, cardiology, seizures, anything that they will possibly come across, he wants them to be trained for. And that, to me, is the the differentiating factor. There are services that come along about the same time, and there are services that come along a year or so later. But in in 66, 67, when this program is conceived and enacted, this sort of training and this ambitiousness, it doesn't exist elsewhere. It was that professionalism born of solid training that caught the eye of a young man who was working as an orderly in Presbyterian Hospital. I just happened to be uh, in a patient's room and uh, two guys came in, uh, all dressed in white, to do an inter-hospital transport. It was just something about these two gentlemen, their confidence and their professionalism, that kind of caught my eye. It was just these two guys that kind of, I was in awe of them. So I'm thinking, wow, this is amazing. How can I do that? I've been in the hospital for about four or five years now, and it's all enclosed. Uh, maybe it's time for me to look at something else. And I happened to look at the patch on their shirt. That's John Moon, who as a young man was looking for his next step in life. And he was struck by the crisp efficiency of the Freedom House paramedics. He just had to know more. So I looked through the yellow pages and (laughs) was able to discover Freedom House Ambulance Service was located on the 10th floor of Presbyterian Hospital. That should be easy to find. I walked across the street from the hospital, went up to the 10th floor, walked in and told the gentleman, I'm here to put in an application. He says, okay, here's a little preliminary exam that we give all applicants. And I'm saying, okay, no problem. He said, if I asked you to diagram parts of the lung, could you do that? No. What about the chambers of the heart? No. What about the respiratory tree? No, he said, well, I'm sorry, you're not qualified to work here. And I left there kind of despondent and uh, went back and said, now, there has to be some place I can get this type of training and become qualified. I started skimming the yellow pages and couldn't find anything. And there was an advertisement on television as to where you could get ambulance attendance training. Uh, It was at a local fire academy. I said, okay, so I called and signed up, and I went to this training and got my certificate and went back to Freedom House and was hired on the spot. But John Moon actually came to Freedom House a little later in the game. Back at the very beginning, it was really tough to find new recruits, people willing to undergo intensive training for a career path that actually didn't even exist yet. Kevin Hazard. When they go out to begin recruiting people, all they get is blank stares. You know, as you said, this is not an easy sell. I mean, imagine somebody comes to you and says, hey, you're 35. You have a wife and you have two children. I want you to quit your job. I'm going to walk away from those people and come to me for 10 hours a day, sometimes nights, sometimes weekends for eight or nine months. So I want you to put your life on hold for the better part of a year to study this new form of medicine, to train for a job that technically doesn't exist. It's impossible now for us to realize that 
1966, nobody had any understanding of this. Nobody, emergency room doctors are not a specialty yet. So this sort of broad spectrum training is not something that is universally understood or put into place. And here's a guy saying, hey, you're not going to be doctors and you're not going to be nurses, but you're going to be able to do everything. You're going to be able to do more than a, a nurse and you're going to be able to do stuff that only a doctor can do, like read and, and shock heart rhythms and intubate patients and deliver drugs. But you're not going to have the same training as either of those people. And we're going to put you in the back of a moving vehicle and you're going to spend half your time on the street or in somebody's living room. and there technically isn't a name for this job yet, and we're not ex entirely sure how you're going to get paid, or even once we know how much we're going to pay you, where that money's going to come from. So it's a huge gamble, and I'm sure that these guys are looking at them like, no, no. So they're trying for months to recruit a class large enough for Saffer. And finally, he gets impatient, and he calls Freedom House one night, and he says, we're starting in the morning, and hangs up at the phone. There are three or four volunteers that are there. And they kind of look at each other and they say, well, I guess we got to do something. So they run out in the street and they're literally grabbing, you know, quote unquote, volunteers by the arm and leading them through the door and saying, hey, we'll give you dinner if you just come in and sign your name, that, promising you'll come here tomorrow morning. And so the final group of volunteers are quite literally dragged off the street and brought in and sat at a desk and have really no idea what they've gotten themselves into. And in walks Peter Saffer and begins this incredibly intense program. So he starts training them. He does. He does. He, they start the very first day. Among the first things that they have to do is sort of figure out who they've got. They do psychiatric evaluations. They do academic evaluations. Some people are disqualified straight away. A lot of the people have criminal records or history of substance abuse, which they do not see as a deterrent. I mean, the whole point was we, we're looking for ordinary people. Ordinary people have all kinds of problems. And so, you know, these are things that they will work their way through. They will help some of these applicants get their GEDs while they're going through this program. The only thing that they ask or that they demand is 100% commitment. These guys will have to be there Monday through Friday. They will have to be there nights. They will have to be there weekends. And then they will have to learn a brand of medicine that no one's ever learned before. And it's an incredibly demanding program. And it stretches on and on and on. Some of them quit. Some of them are kicked out. But he makes his way through with 24 of these guys. From there, they begin what can only be described as residencies. They go to the ER, they go to the OR, they go to OB, they go to surgical units, they go everywhere. And Saffer's idea is, I want you to see more than you could possibly ever be asked to do. So that someday, when you're on the side of the road with a patient whose leg is horribly mangled, you will know what you're supposed to do. And you will have a very clear picture of what everybody else is supposed to do. So you'll know exactly where you fit in this chain. It will just all make sense to you. Like he's trying to give them this sort of holistic view of medicine. He doesn't want them to look you know, through their little periscope of, of ambulance work. He wants them to see the entire picture and to understand where they exist in the context of emergency medicine. John Moon exhibited that rare sort of mindset that revels in the kinds of challenges that most other people find daunting. This deep water was where he wanted to swim, and his desire to swim better and better, well, it only grew as his knowledge increased, along with his confidence. One crisis situation after another. I always wanted the most serious calls, because that presented a challenge to me to reverse the course of whatever that problem was. And, and that's what uh, all of the training that I'd gone through at Freedom House put me in the mindset that there was no situation that you couldn't handle. And I went into every call like that. The results were not always the outcome that you would want, but there was no situation that you couldn't handle, no injury, no illness that you weren't prepared to deal with. Pre-hospital care takes you out of a controlled environment and puts you into an uncontrolled environment. So it's somewhat problematic to take, say, a dermatologist or even a cardiologist out of their environment and place them into the street because there's no such thing as nurse get me this and get me that. You have to do that. What you have now is emergency medicine is a specialty unto itself. And I believe Freedom House had a lot to do with that because we actually brought the emergency room to the person. And when you do that, in the majority of the cases, you eliminate the possibility of rushing this person 
to the emergency room because it's what's done for them before they get there that plays a major role in whether their life is saved or not, not the time limit and to which you get them there. And that's the difference in what the people in the Hill District were actually experiencing. Unfortunately, we were confined to a certain limited geographical location, but the impact that we made was enormous. We were a victim of our own success because there were areas within the geographical boundaries of the city of Pittsburgh, which we were not allowed to provide care to, began to voice their disapproval. By now, I need to be explicit about what has been mostly implicit to this point. The Freedom House paramedics, situated in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, were African-American, and when the program first launched, Pittsburgh approved their presence and their work on city streets, but only if they restricted their activity to emergencies within the Hill District, never beyond. So ironically, because of racial prejudice, the city was denying cutting-edge emergency care to its white population living elsewhere in town. I asked Kevin Hazard about these issues. Well, the tensions begin before they're even done with school. They're actually barred from entering the OB ward. Nurses stand in front of the door and physically block them from entering. So they have to learn how to deliver babies by videotape. Then when they get to the ER, they have the same problem. And Saffer has to come running down and get them into the emergency room. But then when they're in the emergency room, nurses hand them up because in the mind of nurses, they look like orderlies. At every turn, before they're even on the street, they've got to, they don't have to just prove their metal as professionals. They've got to prove their worth as people, which these guys entered into a program that they did not fully understand, that the world itself did not fully understand, and that they, they went through all this, made it through these sort of hurdles, with the quiet dignity speaks volumes to the people of that neighborhood. And it shows how badly they wanted their opportunity. You know, th- these are guys who were not going to be denied. And so they finally get through the program. They finish in spring of 1968. So the very first time that they're on ambulances is after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And the Hill District is, as many cities are, roiled by violence. And you know, the police can't get in. The fire department can't get in. And so Freedom House is conscripted to go in and help transport people who are sick or injured. So that's their sort of baptism. Throughout the entirety of the seven years that that they are in existence, they have to deal with police who, one, as you pointed out, find them to be competition, that find them to be less than. Almost the entire police force is white. Those are two communities that have a tremendously acrimonious relationship. So they're not coming at, to each other from a point of, of mutual respect or, or professionals. You know, there, there's John Moon, who I spent a lot of time talking with. And, you know, John would arrive on scene and would see the police officers who didn't have the training he did doing something wrong. And he would say, Hol, hold on, wait, you guys got to stop. And they would spin on him and say, shut the hell up or you're going to jail. And you know, that was an almost daily occurrence where they had, you know, these, these arguments that they had with the police. Usually... You arrive on the scene, particularly uh, in narcotic overdoses. If you're there with the police, their mindset is to swoop and scoop the patient and get him out of there. Once we arrive on the scene, basically, we have to provide treatment while the patient's there. It's They don't understand that particular situation. So what you try to do is to give them an assignment. So here, I'm going to show you how to bag valve mass this person. So you kind of teach them right there on the spot on a a basic procedure while you can attend to uh, something of a more severe nature. Not that you're not monitoring him because you're, you're kind of looking out the side of your eye to make sure he's doing exactly what you instructed him to do. So anytime we encounter a a life-threatening situation, they happen to be on the scene. It was a teaching type situation also. And there were many of those. Oftentimes, in life-threatening calls, that the police were actually sent and Freedom House was not. So we had to improvise. So what we did is we bought a police scanner and we scanned every call that the police went on. And we listened for, for obviously serious medical calls. 
An example, uh, if you're sending the police for a drug overdose, you're sending obviously a wagon with two officers in it uh, who had very minimal, if any type of training, we would respond to that call long before they got there. And there were often times we would get to the scene, treat and begin transporting the patient. And we would actually pass the police vehicle on the way <laughs> to the scene. And we've gotten the patient and gone. Critical cases, we would jump on all of them to the point where the police all but expected us to do that. Remember, we're only localized to one geographical area, so it wasn't really that large. So we started monitoring the police calls to life-threatening emergencies, and we would call their dispatch and tell them Freedom House is on the way. I hope the big picture here is coming together for you. It looks like this. Professionally trained personnel from Freedom House go out onto the streets to save lives. Many members of the white police force resent their presence and grossly underestimate just how vital their work is. They see only intruders on their beats. But lacking the training to do what people like John Moon can do, they haven't got a leg to stand on. Freedom House was intent on mobilizing, on responding to local medical crises and needs, those emergencies. Who else was there to help? And the police were foolish not to welcome them. Eventually, the police would have to swallow their pride, come around, see the light. Meanwhile, caught in the tension between police and paramedics were the patients themselves. And here the story gets almost impossible to believe. It might help to remember that racism, as we all know, is often intransigent, rooted so deeply that it's unflinching no matter how high the price. So imagine a black responder like John Moon arriving to treat somebody who's just been in a car crash or had a heart attack or can't breathe or otherwise is lying flat on the ground, helpless under the open sky. And that person refuses treatment because Moon is black. When paramedics first became a thing in America, did some people really stick to their bigotry and die for it? That's the question we'll pick things up with in part two of our podcast about America's first first responders. It's the origin story of street medicine, of modern ambulances and the people who ride inside them, both the helpers and the helped. I'm Marcus Smith, and this is Constant Wonder. Our guests for this two-part episode are Kevin Hazard and John Moon. Hazard is author of American Sirens, the incredible story of the black men who became America's first paramedics. And John Moon was one of those pioneering paramedics from Freedom House. Theirs is a tale of something so brilliant in concept, but so obvious to us today that we could easily overlook the sheer wonder of this historic moment in history. Producers for this two-part episode of Constant Wonder are Eric Schultzka and Colson Darrington, with assistance from Addie Mangum, Josh Cloward, and the BYU Broadcasting Sound Design Team. I'm Marcus Smith. Constant Wonder is a production of BYU Radio. BYU Radio.